You know, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Brass, who is uh, joining us from Indiana today. Um, and uh, her, the title of her talk is, as, as you can see the screen, Allies or Adversaries, NGOs and the, the, the State. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, you know, it's, it's often a question uh, in terms of civil society, NGOs, et cetera, the extent to which they are independent, the extent to which they should be independent, and there are, you know, these questions which are both uh, normative in nature and in some ways, uh, you know, empirical. And I think that's what makes the makes questions such as these so interesting. Uh, this book that Dr. Brass is going to be presenting, uh, as, as she was just sharing, was sort of, you know, came out of a dissertation. And uh, it's won, you know, very significant awards. It's been recognized uh, by, uh, you know, the top most associations in this field. So I think it's it's uh, you know undoubtedly you know our uh, privilege to be able to hear directly from her about this work. Uh, she is she works a lot in Africa uh, on these issues. Uh, she's published in all the top journals that you know generally sort of publish uh, work around these topics. So um, and as she mentioned, this is probably one of the silver linings of the whole pandemic and you know our ability to hold these webinars. So. Thank you again so much, Jennifer, for joining us. And just let me let me just add for the audience that what we've uh, what we if you have any uh, sort of clarificatory questions, you could maybe ask, or you could just put them on chat as well, so that she, you know uh, if she needs to, she can address that. But we'll keep the bulk of the question answers and the conversations and the discussions towards the end. So with that, uh, uh, Dr. Brass, over to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So um, thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, I'm really excited to be here and get a chance to share some of my research with you. Um, as mentioned, I do see the ability to do this sort of thing and, and the fact that it's become normal really as, as one of the clear silver linings of the pandemic. Um, so thank you to Professor Anker for moderating and to Bikab and Abhishek for the initial um, email invitation. Um, just to tell you a little bit more about me. So I'm an associate professor at the Indiana University O'Neill School of Public Environmental Affairs, um, where I teach at the undergrad, masters, and doctoral levels um, and work with uh, PhD students. Um, my research sort of looks at service provision in developing countries generally. Um, so one, one strand of my research, this strand looks at NGOs and international development, looking mostly at how NGOs uh, provide services and then how they interact with states to do so. Um, and then my other strand of research looks at a specific service sector, electricity, and I look at um, how access to electricity both traditional access via the, the main grid and um, renewable access or small scale access, how that affects um, individuals' livelihoods and their um, participation in the public sphere. Um, so my PhD is in political science. It's from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, and with that, I will begin. Um, so um, just to give you a brief overview of what the talk will be, um, I'll provide you a little bit of background. I think all of you are probably familiar with NGOs. Sometimes audiences aren't, uh, mostly in the US. Uh, I'll talk about what the question, the main question driving the book is, which is about um, how NGOs providing services affects um, the state and development. Um, I'll present my main argument which is that NGOs have become um, a core part of the organizational form of the state when it comes to service provision, um, and that the NGOs are actually strengthening the state, or they did so in Kenya, by extending and reinforcing um, public administration um, and policymaking. So I'll provide you some evidence, and again, this comes from field work that I did over about two years in Kenya. Um, talk a little bit about the implications and also talk about uh, field work specifically um, and some of the challenges of doing original data collection and then writing it up. So to jump off, uh, this is the definition of an NGO that I'm using. 
So uh, this comes from the Republic of Kenya statute law from 1992. So it's the Kenyan government's definition of an NGO. Um, so they say an NGO is a private voluntary grouping of individuals or associations not operated for profit or for other commercial purposes, but which have organized themselves nationally or internationally for the benefit of the public and the promotion of social welfare, development, charity, or research. And so they give sort of a, a really specific um, definition. One of the things that comes out of this is that I'm not making a distinction between national or Kenyan organizations and international organizations. Um, because I think what that means in Kenya is really quite blurry. Um, and as an example of what I mean, the um, most of, regardless of the origin of an NGO, most funding comes from international sources in Kenya, over 90%. But also, so 90% of international funding, but staff are about 98% uh, Kenyan. Um, so whether internationally based organizations with Kenyan staff should be considered international or Kenyan, I think there's um, some blurriness there. Uh, so this project group came out of an empirical observation that I had when working in Kenya um, almost two decades ago, just noting the, the, how much NGOs were growing in prominence in Sub-Saharan Africa in the 1990s and the 2000s. And I was really curious about what these NGOs were doing and then what effect they had. So what effect did they have on governance, on decision making in the, in the public sector, um, on service provision, and um, on public management in the civil service. Um, so I started thinking about these things in Kenya during the end of the authoritarian Moi regime, which would have been um, in the very early 2000s. Um, in the book, I also show, uh, mostly in the concluding chapter, that um, a lot of these patterns are similar in Latin America, elsewhere in Africa, Central Asia, East Asia, um, and so on. Um, and I can talk about why NGOs grew during Q&A if you like, but I, I, I assume this audience knows a bit about that. So. Um, as an initial point, I was curious, what are these NGOs doing or what do they say that they're doing? Um, and so I was able to get a copy of the Government of Kenya's NGO registry, um, and which had about, at the time, about 4,000 organizations. So I coded um, the organizations in the registry by the name of the organization and what they listed as their primary activities. And what I saw is that most organizations are sort of aimed to provide general development, or not most, but a plurality, um, meaning that they did things, a combination of things, like they would say that they were aiming to improve health, livelihood, and education outcomes, or they would be sort of location focused and say things like, um, that they were interested in improving the livelihood of people in a specific area. Um, the next largest group I categorize as marginal groups, and that was uh, organizations focused on women, children, orphans, the youth, and the disabled or the elderly. So beyond those sort of large categories, you see um, education as, and health as the, the main things. And then I thought it was significant that um, actually just a small minority are primarily involved in democracy and governance. And to me, that was interesting based on the literature on NGOs, which suggests that, that NGOs are doing a lot of democracy and governance work. Um, so at least in their applications to the government that they were not saying that. And then I found um, through survey research that quite a substantial uh, portion of individuals, so these are randomly sampled individuals, were seeking out NGOs. So I asked a question in a survey about how many times have you gone to an NGO seeking training, information, a service, or for a f physical good? Um, and I did this survey in three um, then districts, now they're called counties, of Kenya, and found that between 18 and 30 percent, or about 20 and 30 percent of people, so about a fifth to a third of people, had actively sought out NGOs for 
for some sort of service provision. So all of that uh, provides background to this big question that I had, which is what effect is this proliferation of NGOs providing services? What effect has it had on developing states? And initially when I was forming my hypotheses, my, my hypothesis going into this research was that NGOs were undermining the state, that they were challenging territorial integrity, autonomy, legitimacy, decision-making power, um, and very much I thought this uh, fit into the um, governance literature that talks about governance without government. Um, some of this looking at what's happening in weak states, um, areas of limited statehood, that you have basically NGOs come, stepping in to provide things and that this was undermining the state. Um, what I found uh, as a preview is that actually NGOs more were bolstering the state. Um, and I think theoretically this comes from questions about um, civil society, uh, somewhat on ideology, ide ideological views of private actors, um, things that the World Bank are putting forth, that the opening of public spaces to private actors like NGOs allows the government to focus on core competencies, um, while other organizations can sort of supplement that. Um, so I looked in the book at four areas of, of what it means to be a state. So territoriality, having to do with physical space and authority over it. Uh, governance, looking both at policy making and policy implementation. Administrative capacity, that's uh, within the government, within public, within the civil service and then legitimacy. And, and legitimacy was really sort of the, one of the core things I was interested in going, going into the research. So in the book, I make three arguments. Um, actually, over the course of writing the book, I, I came to believe that we need to move past this really facile, do they undermine or do they support debate, to look more into how NGOs and governments interact in sort of a comprehensive, systematic, and theoretically grounded way, which leads to these three um, more um, intertwined arguments. The first is that um, there has, over time, over the course of the 1990s and into the 2000s, the 2010s, um, we've seen a broadly increase in the collaborative nature of NGO government relationships um, and that this collaboration has blurred traditional state, non-state boundaries. And in doing so, I argue that it changes the nature of the state. So the state is no longer just public agencies and public administration, but we can actually think of NGOs as part of the broader organizational form of the state. And then very much contrary to belief or the literature and also my hypothesis going in, uh, NGO service provision does not undermine state legitimacy, at least in, in Kenya, um, as, I, as I studied it. Um, so um, I'll talk about each of these arguments. Just as a preview, the evidence again comes from Kenya. I chose Kenya uh, partially or largely because it's sort of a middle of the road developing country. It, um, at the time of research, was about to hit middle income status. Um, Freedom House, a measure of its uh, political regime type, scores Kenya um, uh, as partly free for much of its history, placing it sort of squarely in the middle of the political um, regimes. Um, and unlike some extremely poor or weak African countries, Kenya has a developed manufacturing and export sector. It has a growing technology sector, um, programming and so on, and, in, and a rapidly expanding middle class. Um, so it makes it more comparable with many countries of Asia or Latin America. Um, so I did both qualitative and quantitative data collection and analysis. Qualitatively, I did about, I conducted about a hundred, a bit more than a hundred interviews, primarily in three districts of the country. Um, and then I did some follow-up interviews later 
um, in four other districts of the country. Um, I focused on street level civil servants and administrators, not just politicians and elites, and not just folks in Nairobi, because I think you get a very different understanding of things when you talk to people in the capital city versus um, elsewhere in the country. Um, and then um, quantitatively, I conducted two or conducted and implemented two original surveys of about 500 individuals. Um, I also collected data on uh, over 4,200 NGOs spread across um, what were then 70 districts of Kenya. Kenya has since uh, reorganized how the country is run, so it no longer has districts, but I talk about districts because um, that's what was how it was done at the time of data collection. Um, and then in addition, I merged that data on NGO with statistical data from uh, government agencies, the UN, the World Bank, uh, Afrobarometer survey data, and so on. Um, so I use the, this mixed method approach because I think Qualitative data helps us interpret the findings of quantitative analysis more clearly. Um, and I'll talk about this more in a bit when I talk about the methodological challenges. But in, in many countries in Africa, data on big questions like how does this affect the state is unavailable or really unreliable. Um, and so original data collection can help to validate findings. Um, as can interviews. So um, it allowed me to triangulate on findings um, for this, this big question. So looking at each of the three arguments in turn, um, my first argument is about this increasingly collaborative relationship that I saw um, developing over time between NGOs and the state in Kenya. And we might ask, so why is this happening? Why are we seeing more collaboration? Um, and I think the first reason that came, that comes to mind is that a lot of donors actually require it. So for example, the Global Fund to Fight Tuberculosis, or sorry, to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, um, they don't give money to ministries of health unless they have civil society partners or NGO partners. Um, likewise, the World Bank, um, over the course of the 1990s and 2010s, increased the um, percentage of its programs that required civil society involvement from about 20% of its programs to um, nearly 90% of its programs. And so donors were saying you must involve civil society. So that's one reason that you're seeing NGOs and states come together. But another reason in Kenya is that you had a change in leadership and really very different leadership styles. So um, in the mostly the 80s and the 90s for 24 years, um, this man Daniel Arab Moy was president. Um, he was a very serious authoritarian command and control leader who um, really centralized almost all that was done in the office of the president. You can see this with this imagery. He always carried this stick, which is called a rungu. Um, and he's often photographed with military of some sort. You have this um, change in 2002 for the first um, democratic change of power uh, to Mwai Kibaki, who was president from 2000 to 2012. I mean, you can see in this image, he was, I think it represents sort of um, him as a much more approachable leader. He was uh, a technocrat in the civil service himself for many decades, and he was very interested in delegating to others and allowing experts and technocrats to do their job. Um, so where Moy was very repressive of civil society and NGOs, Kibaki, let them in. He hired many, many civil society leaders into the government. And then you had this sort of uh, working of civil society leaders with the, that regime. But even in places where neither of these things happened, where you didn't see a change in leader, and um, even in, in uh, some places where, where donors pulled out for some time, you saw this collaboration. Um, and I, I like to think that this was sort of social learning among NGOs and governments that it was actually in their mutual interest 
um, to work together. So they realized that there were benefits to be had from joining forces rather than um, work being primarily conflictual, which is what was the case during the, the Daniel Moy years. Um, so some quotes that illustrate this from, from my field research. So I heard frequently, so this is the new global approach. You must involve everyone now, sort of thinking about ideas of collaborative governance and, um, and uh, multi-sector governance. Um, but also some civil servants giving credit to NGOs for this. So a civil servant in, that I interviewed saying, it's, a, it's NGOs that made government open our eyes. We have made a lot of changes. And so that leads to some extent to the second argument that you have this boundary between governments and NGOs becoming porous or blurry over time. And you see this happening as one example in policymaking so on the screen is a list of different policies that NGOs I spoke to um, were involved in or groups of policymakers that they were on. So you see things like, um, and one NGO manager I spoke to said that her organization actually wrote the code of ethics for one of the government ministries. So the, the uh, internal policy on ethics for that ministry was, was literally written by an NGO. Um, you have NGOs drafting legislat legislation, um, and at more local levels, NGOs participating on um, local development committees, county council boards, um, and so on. And, and some of those things are actually required again. So NGOs are are literally making a part of the decision-making body um, of the government. And then you see this also in policy implementation. So NGOs were often, many, many NGOs I spoke to um, and government officials as well, talked about how much they benefit benefited from, from joining forces with, um, with NGOs to sort of make their programs go farther. So one example um, of shared offices is I spoke with one NGO whose offices were, were literally in the ministry, a ministry building. They were renting space from the ministry so that they could work really closely with the ministry. So they were physically located in the ministry office. Um, another example would be um, a particularly technical ministry staff. So I saw this a few times with water engineers or other sort of engineers from the, the Ministry of Water being seconded to NGOs to provide engineering expertise needed for things like drilling boreholes or, or um, providing clean water in other ways. Um, another example would be of joint programs. So here's a, an example you can see if you read along the bottom, you've got a lot of different government and non-governmental organizations working together on a blood drive. So I saw this in a place um, called Machacos, where the government for this blood drive was providing social mobilization and had the staff to physically collect the blood. And they provided about 25% of the funding while the NGO was providing the rest of the funding and coordinating the entire program from, from the point of collection to storage. Um, and so these sort of collaborative things were, were very, very, very common. And then we saw this also in um, the government planning documents. So uh, at the time the government of Kenya was doing district development plans, it now does county development plans. Um, but these plans are sort of um, more localized plans for how the, the county or, or then district would develop. And I noticed it, so I read through a lot of them um, and noticed that they frequently said things, the government was frequently writing things like NGOs are responsible for doing this project that we're doing, or they're required to do it, or it's expected that NGOs will do this. And so the government was explicitly integrating NGO work into what it considers its own work. Um, one example of this from a district called Makueni. So Makueni proposed 149 
projects that would be undertaken over the next five years. And of those, about 30% explicitly mentioned implementation or funding by, by NGOs. So again, the NGOs themselves are doing the government work. And this is not in a contracting relationship uh, for the most part. In some cases it is, but for the most part, um, it, it's more of a collaborative relationship. So one example of sort of the, the change towards uh, working with NGOs came from a place called West Pocot, where they said lessons learned Projects that were implemented with assistance from NGOs and other development agencies performed better than those that were implemented by the government alone. There is thus a need to collaborate with all stakeholders during the preparation of the current plans. So looking forward, they were saying, okay, we need to make sure the NGOs are involved in this. Um, and partly because of the merging of civil society or the hiring of civil society actors when um, Waikibaki came into power, you had a real change in thinking um, where one uh, civil servant I spoke to said, civil society was all swallowed by government. So government is thinking like NGOs following that, that change of power. And so in some way you saw change among public servants and more, more somewhat democratic values seeping into the governance pattern in the public agencies. So around this time, there was the introduction of service charters, performance appraisals, um, basically advertising civil servants, and advertising a much more participatory approach to how they work. Um, uh, a move towards working harder um, and having more accountability. I need to emphasize, however, that a lot of these changes were small and inc incremental, um, and they were starting in, in many places in Kenya from a very small, low baseline. So um, I, I remember a civil servant saying to me as though this were you know, a really big change, you have to show up at work now. So we're moving from a place where you didn't actually have to show up at work to a place where you do have to go. Um, and, and, and another civil servant told me that, that the change was sort of represented by the fact that in the earlier decades, government ministries had no money and employees of government could do what they wanted with the money that was there. But now things are changing. Now you have to work. You have to go down there to the divisions to actually to the local people and actually do your job. Um, and a lot of people sort of claim that the integration of civil society and sort of learning from civil society was, was a big part of that. Um, and then finally, my third argument is that NGOs not undermine the social contract between citizens and their government, or they do not undermine the legitimacy of government. Um, and again, this is not what I expected to see um, what this graph before you shows um, is responses to the question, to what extent do these organizations have the interests of the people in mind? Um, looking at Kenyan politicians, Kenyan civil servants, Kenyan-based NGOs and international NGOs. And you can see that uh, the most negative views are of Kenyan politicians followed by civil servants. And the most positive views are of international and national um, NGOs. And so, so this is where I thought they may be undermining government is coming from this idea that Kenyans are very supportive of NGOs. They like NGOs. Um, and um, even though that was the case, when I did regression analysis, um, looking at whether having gone to an NGO, having been approached by an NGO, having received services by an NGO. So a bunch of different model specifications on both the independent variable and dependent variable side. I did not find any statistically significant relationship between NGOs and legitimacy. Um, and uh, when it was significant in models, it was positive. And so if anything, NGOs were, were improving state legitimacy. So of course I wondered, 
why is this happening? This was not what I was expecting to find. And what I learned was that, um, for one thing, the government is actually successfully taking credit for the work that NGOs were doing. So here's an example of an NGO might um, open a clean water borehole and an MP or, or local politician might come out and come to the ribbon cutting. And so they're associated with this, this project. Um, another example over here, um, you've got a plaque of an NGO funded school building that the uh, Ministry of, Minister of Education has managed to get his name on. Um, and so credit taking took many forms. So some of them were subtle, like removing NGOs names in the authorship of jointly created policy documents um, to really blatant things like politicians and administrators publicly and unambiguously um, declaring that they arranged for, or even sometimes funded an NGO to work in an area. Um, and so what people said, and this was uh, NGO workers said that sometimes they actually allowed government to, to give credit, but they said that the, the common people end up thankful for government for allowing the NGOs to operate there and that they know that the government has to agree for an NGO to um, work in an area before they are able to do so. And so they, they credited the government with the work that the NGOs were doing. But I think there's another thing going on, which is that legitimacy, theoretically legitimacy derives from having satisfied people's needs and their expectations over time. And that African expectations of governments are just really very low. Um, and that people were able to understand that the government wasn't able to do it all. They see government representatives living in their same conditions. Um, they see that the government isn't able, doesn't necessarily have the resources for everything. And so they're not expecting quite a lot from government. Um, one of the, the uh, most telling quotes I thought was um, a civil servant said, actually the problem is when they're when NGOs are not there. The regular people of Kenya, the one in Chi in Swahili, don't care that the government is not there when NGOs are there. As long as one is there, all is okay. But if none, then they get angry at government. You rarely find a place where neither NGOs or government is there. Um, and so uh, another civil servant said, so NGOs don't reflect poorly on government you see government being helped by NGOs, um, increasing overall satisfaction levels. And so I came to, to think that actually part of this is that NGOs were providing hope for um, people, particularly in rural areas, particularly for the very poor. Um, and I realized that many NGOs actually have this in the, the name of their, their, um, the name of their organization all over the world. Um, and so I think this is part of it as well. Uh, I want to end before talking just briefly about uh, data and fieldwork challenges with um, some uh, caveats to what I've said. So I think my work is often taken as being very, very optimistic and rosy, and I'm not sure that I actually um, feel that way. I think that there's a lot of problems with a reliance on NGOs. Um, there's a lot of issues in terms of NGOs completely skirting democratic processes for governance, um, even where they're flawed processes. Um, elections, you know, allow citizens to, to comment on the quality of governance and NGOs are not involved in that. Um, NGOs, I think, are not always particularly effective. They, I think NGOs waste quite a lot of money or they can waste quite a lot of money. Um, and I worry that the donor giving to NGOs um, can, can harm sort of the long-term development of public administrations within government um, any, in many countries. Um, so I can talk more about this in Q&A if you like. But coming back around to the data um, and fieldwork, 
I was asked to speak a little bit about fieldwork and writing challenges. And of course I can ask, answer more questions about this as well. But I'll present just three challenges. Um, one was uh, research design challenges. So when I presented this as a, an idea for a dissertation or thesis, my supervisor told me that I was gonna have to try a lot of creative ways to get at this data and that I would probably end up banging my head against the wall many, many times because there's no, there was no data available for this. Um, even the fact that I got the data, uh, the, some of the database from the Kenyan government was unusual. Um, I'm not sure why they were willing to give that to me because other people have tried to get it and they haven't gotten it. Um, but what I did was initially take a qualitative approach, which you can see in a lot of this research. Um, but after talking to quite a few people, I realized that it was insufficient to, to answer what I wanted to, to do. So I actually was able to come back home. I put together um, two different surveys and that's when I started um, gathering a lot of the data that was used in what became a, an article in the journal World Development about why NGOs end up where they do. Um, and so I ended up um, doing things like, oh, uh, as well, I should mention during the Moy regime, um, you weren't allowed to do individual level surveys on anything that could be construed as remotely political. So I wanted to be able to show things about legitimacy over time, but there was almost no data on that. Eventually I found um, a survey that was done uh, shortly after independence in the late 1960s and was able to replicate, replicate that, um, you know, however many years later which was interesting because it showed that legitimacy on the whole counter to expectations hadn't really gone down in Kenya. And that's, that's not, not really the narrative. Um, so what helped more than anything was having sort of an iterative field research process where I could stop at times, um, reflect on what I had, the data that I had, reflect on what else I needed if I were to try to, you know, really paint a full picture um, and also what that led to was, was the necessity of a book. So if you look at any one chapter of the empirical chapters, you really don't get the full picture and you need the whole book, I think, to bring things together. Another uh, challenge that I had was in interviewing. Um, so initially, um, and this was where I hit a roadblock. Initially, I was gonna do very specific research on the education sector, the health sector, and the policing or security sector because I think these are areas where sort of core areas of govern, government service provision, things we expect the state to do. I made some headway on that, um, but then it ended up getting stymied at um, the Kenyan police headquarters. Uh, and it took me quite a while to realize that they were going to keep inviting me back and then not telling me anything um, because they, that was just not something that was done in, in, the, in the police unit, at least at that time. And so um, I kept getting invited back. Oh, you need to talk to this other person. Oh, no, you need to talk to this other person. And I, I finally realized that, no, it didn't matter who I talked to. I was, no one was going to tell me things like the number of police officers in different places in Kenya, which is part of the, the thing I was looking for so that I could compare the number of non-state uh, policing to state policing. Um, I think one of the things that helped when I was able to get data um, is knowing my posi positionality in society. So at the time I had a mix where people didn't quite know what to do with me, which I think helped. So I was a woman um, and I used to look very young and I think I looked sort of harmless. And so people would tell me things that I wouldn't expect to have been told. Um, but also in Kenya, there's a, a very racial hierarchy. This isn't true in, in most of Africa, African places I've been, but in Kenya, being white does sometimes let you, um, give you access to things that arguably, I mean, I think it shouldn't. But it, but it sometimes does. And so I think this, these were things that, that helped um, 
disarm me or made me appear dis, uh, disarmed uh, to interview participants. And then finally, I'll talk just a tiny bit about writing challenges. So one of the challenges that I had was, um, as I mentioned several times, my data disconfirmed my hypothesis. Um, and when that first happens, it can be a, a bit jarring of an experience trying to figure out, well, do I still have something here? Um, and eventually I decided, yes, I did. It just wasn't the story I thought I was going to tell. Um, I ended up, when I was doing field research, anytime I could get data on anything, I, I, I grabbed it and collected it. Um, if people showed me, oh, I have this interesting thing um, about NGOs or about where we're doing projects, and sometimes they had you know, good visualizations, I would ask for copies of that, which sometimes worked and sometimes didn't. Um, but I ended up, when I was then writing the, the thesis, I had sort of an overwhelming amount of data. Um, the silver lining of that is that um, I was able to use it in many more publications um, going into the pre-tenure process. Um, I think there's the, it can be quite difficult to organize a book-length project, so deciding whether to do it in certain thematic ways or other ways can be challenging. Um, but what I realized and what I would recommend to anyone working on this sort of thing is that it helps to, um, as I've written, take baby steps or to cut things into very, 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 very small, um, discrete tasks. And then rather than say, I need to write a thesis, say, I need to complete this one task. And so where I ended up having a lot of success was saying to myself, okay, I need to write 300 to 500 words every single day. And once I'm done with that on any day, I can go and do whatever I want. So I think that you, that as a student, it's easy to get into a mindset of, I need to write this entire book and it's overwhelming. So I will do many, many things to procrastinate, or at least that's how I was. Um, but having a very small goal, I was like, oh, I can do that. Um, and if you write 500 words a day, you will have a, a book length manuscript very, very quickly. So I will stop there um, and take questions. Um, and I'm also going to stop my share sharing screen so they can um, see people better if that's okay. Uh, so we have the floor open for questions. I have a couple of questions, but I'm just waiting to see if, um, and I, I, I and it's uh, grateful you, you you ended in some ways in an optimistic note, saying that look, all that you need to do is really write these 500 words a day, and you, <laughs> you, you, you'll, you'll get there eventually. So I think those are good inspirational words to for everybody. Uh, yes, Sri. Uh, such kind. We are uh, MGN fellows. We are posted in uh, different districts of uh, all over India. So coming to one of the uh, things that I have observed in my district is that uh, uh, the district administration is focusing something which is uh, I mean like of value to them by itself, uh, not particularly where a lot of uh, things are to be done. For example skill development is a field where things are to be done but uh, it is being ignored as a uh, as a department of uh, employment in my district is completely ignored they don't even bother there is a department existing in the government structure so how do we address these kind of things do you want me to take uh, one question and respond to it or take a couple maybe we could take one or two more if there is somebody wanting to ask another question. Uh, Shri, I don't think we were able to catch the, so can you just give a little bit more background? You're you're a Mahatma Gandhi National Fellow, right? Yes, sir. And you're working in, along with the district administration. You've been posted there yes, for a period of two years to uh, sort of help enhance uh, the work around skill development. True, sir. Right. And, uh, so, so actually, what's happening here is that uh, we have departments in this country. We have various departments, and uh, we are like our mentor in uh, Telangana. We are employment officers, district officers. 
where anything we are supposed to work in the district we are being made our department files which want to collect our personal collector they remain pending throughout the week that is what make if we if you are planning to take an initiative of any kind it is related to the development or entrepreneurship within the district so these files are being ignored there is a partial within the departments as well so how okay. do we mean like that uh, is there a ngo involvement or civil society sector involvement if you can elaborate because i'm just trying to make sure jennifer sort of aware of the context that you're working in no sir i mean like as as a fellow uh, me myself is planning to take few uh, initiatives uh, with the help of uh, employment office as well as uh, uh, educational institutions education institutions we have a uh, few uh, engineering and professional other colleges so i just want to make use of those institutions okay um maybe we'll take one more to pick priya and there's i think there's one question on chat as well Priya, do you want to go ahead? Thanks, Professor Sir. Um, Jennifer, thank you for that talk. I was uh, curious about why there is no activism from NGOs in Kenya. I think you did touch upon it, but maybe you can elaborate because in India or in many other places, we think of NGOs as very activist organizations against the government, against the corporates, and so on. All right. Should I take those three or four questions? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, I see two in the in the chat. Um, so um, unfortunately, Sri, I did not hear everything that you said. It was um, I'm not sure if the sound was coming through uh, for others, but um, what I heard was that you're working with the district administration on skill development, um, and that the it is clearly needed, but not not being paid attention to by the government. Um, and I would say this is less my area of expertise in terms of the public management side of it. But um, my thought would be uh, one thing that you could do, depending on the level of skill development you need, is you might do something, see if you could do a partnership with a university or a technical school um, to create a curriculum for skill de development. Um, if you have some tools or modules or things like that, I think it depends. I'm not sure at what level you're talking. So if it's um, illiterate people looking to gain some skills or, or people who need numeracy or accounting skills, I think that's one thing. But if it's um, in the US, when we talk about skill development, often it's people with um, high school education who don't have sort of the, the service skills needed um, in today's environment. So I think it, it would maybe afterwards, we could have a little bit longer conversation uh, back and forth about, about the, the level of skill that would be needed, um, because I think the answer somewhat depends on that. Um, and uh, moving on to, I saw Vandana had a question in the chat about how to do research when there's uh, no data. So um, my, my, one of my favorite stories from field research was that I went to speak with the head of social science statistics at the National Department of Statistics. Um, and, I, and I asked him, you know, I've got all this, this government statistics, I got all this information at the district level, how reliable is it? And he literally started laughing at me or with me. Um, and he just threw his head back and he said, well, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, and so he was basically saying, you know, this, this is not necessarily reliable data. And I think when you have that, that challenge, um, if you are able to, the best thing is to collect data yourself. Um, as, a, as a doctoral researcher, that might end up being relatively small amounts of data. Um, so I did these two surveys of 500 people. Um, but one way to do that, to get, I think I, if I were to do it now, I would, I think it would require higher numbers. Um, but one of the things that I did was go to places um, with lots of people, and I was able to get many surveys filled out in a small period of time. 
um, I was doing them at secondary schools. So that involves some IRB or, or um, ethics review to make sure it was okay to work with um, people under the age of 18. Um, but I wasn't asking anything particularly personal or revealing and they were all anonymous. So that was allowed. Um, but the other thing is to get creative with sources of data. So for the, the article that I wrote, that's a chapter in the book that was published in World Development um, on why NGOs go where they go. So I had this NGO database and I ended up, you know, scouring as many different sources as I could for variables that I could put into this uh, quantitative data set so that I could do some analysis on that. Um, so I think uh, it requires being creative and um, also being persistent. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you approach a government agency once, you will get no response. And But if you go many, many times, if you, um, in some cases, I know people who would go and bring a book and, you know, for, for public servants who were too busy to talk to you, they would just say, okay, I'll wait. And they just sit there in the office day after day after day. And eventually the person would be like, okay, this person's not going away. I have to speak with them. Um, and so you would then get information. I think the longest I ever waited to speak with someone was three days, I kept going back. And finally I, I, I caught them. Um, and so sometimes you have to be, be a persistent in that way. Um, in terms of Priya's question about activists, um, so I am definitely not saying that there aren't activists in Kenya, but I think that you see them in many cases primarily in Nairobi, in the capital city, um, and they're there pressuring government um, and pressuring MPs where they are most often, but most organizations are providing services. Um, and most NGOs, I was surprised talk, speaking to NGOs, most of the people I spoke to said they were, they didn't care if the government took credit for their work, or some even said they invited the government to take credit for their work, which I was very surprised by. But I think a lot of researchers do their research in capital cities, particularly foreign researchers, um, so to create critique people like me, they stay in the capital city. And so what they see in the capital is what they think is happening throughout the country. And I think that once you get to a very rural level, um, you see a very different situation. And so it's much more um, NGOs choosing to work with civil servants, not with politicians. In some cases, NGOs actively avoiding politicians and really focusing on getting services um, to people. Um, so I could write a, a we, one could write a different book about um, activists and about um, policy change, civil society, democracy, promotion, NGOs, but, but I was focused on, on service provision. Um, I see a few more. Should I take the questions in the chat? Yes, if that's okay with you, you can, I mean, maybe you could, you know, see through them and see in whatever way you want to do this. Okay. Um, so one of them talks about blurred lines between NGOs and governments at an international level um, and how this collaboration might be fruitful in the space of conflict resolution. I think that is an excellent question. Um, and I'm not sure if you uh, mean international conflict or, or, um, or, national subnational conflict um but i i'm not sure what i would answer in terms of conflict resolution i think where that gets more into these questions of governance as opposed to service provision i think one of the places ngos actually can be problematic is um in active conflict areas or even in refugee camps you can have um, NGOs inadvertently fuel conflict, uh, thinking about service provision, um, because they can provide resources to rebels who might not otherwise get it. So if you look into the humanitarian literature on NGOs, you see that in some cases. Um, I've now just said 
rather than talking about conflict re resolution, I've talked about uh, increasing conflict. I think I would need to think more about the conflict resolution, but I would say um, probably NGOs acting as intermediaries between groups might be one way for that to work. So they might be seen, uh, many NGOs try to be seen as neutral and impartial. And so that might be a way if they are able to collaborate, that might be a way that they could bridge conflicting parties. Um, I think maybe Aditya, if you could unmute and because I, your question is not very clear to me. So I'm not sure if it's very clear to you, Jen. The next one. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I wasn't. I wasn't sure what that was. Aditya, do you want to unmute and just ask your question? Or we could come back to it. Okay, maybe we'll come back to it. Um, um, so is the question, um, is Sayanti here? Yeah, Sayanti, do you want to, yes, you want to share? Yeah. Oh. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Yeah, so uh, my question is like, um, I have like not, much experience in the macro level of this uh, NGOs and government. However, when I was um, doing my dissertation at a micro level, I have seen processes and uh, these policies, um, uh, like uh, like this 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 cease to uh, reach the people that they should reach, and like and I have seen NGOs. Uh, not uh, involving, not uh, investing themselves in this uh, blurredness of uh, social and political fabric. For example, I have given an example that some gro some ground level government staff is also uh, kin to someone in the village, and then so so in the meantime of the negotiations, uh, the ultimately the platform ceases to exist. Maybe that could be a case specific for my case. However. Um, I have seen that uh, NGO not also including, uh, not also in, um, involving themselves into handling this blurredness. So uh, uh, my question was like, um, have you seen this in Kenya? And if you have seen this in micro level, so how the government and the NGOs are uh, working on that issue, that, that fabricated issue, like where it, it gets blurred by the relationships of family and kids. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I don't address this very much in the book, as far as I recall, mm -hmm. but um, this is something I teach about. I teach a course called NGO Management for International Development. Um, and one of the things I think we often miss when we're, when we're teaching management courses is uh, thinking about these social dynamics and political dynamics um, within, within the context where we're working. And so, um, excuse me. <coughs> and so I think one of the things that you need to do is a, as an NGO or as an NGO manager is get a sense of the um, social lay of the land, the political lay of the land, and do have a sense of the, the do a power analysis, frankly, of the place where you're working. So if you don't know, I think often NGOs come in and they don't even realize that people are family or they don't realize um, that the people that maybe if you're going to your your local local level officer is, um, you know, having the NGO speak only to people who are his co-ethnics or or who are part of the their the government officials in group and that the NGO needs to be quite aware that this is possible and i think NGOs often say oh the you know in in Kenya you often talk about chiefs and they'll say oh well the chief brought me out around and had me speak with all these different people um, and they sort of accept that at face value and so one of the things i try to think about is you know, to the extent possible, you have to be there long enough and get to know people long enough to understand what the local politics are and the local power dynamics so that you're not only speaking to friends and family and clients of the, of the, of the chief or the person in charge. Um, I'm not sure if that's 
if that answers your question, but it, but there are um, you know really deliberate ways of doing political feasibility assessments and doing power analyses, um, and I think NGOs need to be doing more of that if they are actually to help you know the poorest of the poor, that kind of thing that they they often say they're aiming to do, but actually fail to do. Um, Thanks, Jennifer. Nirmala has sort of uh, an interesting set of questions uh, about rights-based organizations versus, you know, those who are directly involved in service provision and whether it matters in terms of the source of funding, if it's the independent source of funding or state-driven. Well, so in, yes, I think it absolutely does. Um, oh, I see this. Okay. Um, Uh, yes. So I think that that um, is absolutely true. And one of the things that's interesting in Kenya is that most of the funding comes from international sources. And so in, in some areas of the world, um, and I, I don't know as much about India, but I would guess there's more contracting in India. There's quite a lot more contracting where, where governments actually contract to NGOs to implement service provision. Um, most NGO funding, over 90% of NGO funding in Kenya comes from international sources. So they tend not to be dependent on, on the state for funding, which makes them somewhat independent. But many countries of the world have passed uh, increasingly strict regulations about how much funding from international sources any one organization can get. Um, and they have requirements about how uh, NGOs can work in different places. So in Kenya, for example, NGOs have to get permission from, um, from the government to work in different counties or districts of the country. Um, and so that can stop some of the um, uh, more advocacy oriented um, um, advocacy oriented work that they're doing. Um, but again, I was surprised that most of the NGOs that I was talking to were really not that interested. Once you got out of the capital city, most of them were not that interested in um, in massive advocacy and change. They were really interested in getting goods and services, things like healthcare and clean water and um, a lot of enterprise development services, business development services, largely related to agriculture and sort of helping people um, improve their, their livelihoods in that way. Uh, Bhavna, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, hello, Jennifer. Um, actually, I had two questions. Uh, first, uh, when you mentioned about funding, so when we talk about international funding, especially in Asian nations, uh, so it also hampers the, somewhere uh, manipulates the decision making, which is uh, done by the NGOs. So how would you highlight that point when it comes to international funding? As you mentioned that Kenya has 90% of international funding. So of course, somewhere we see uh, NGOs also operate as lobbies. Uh, in, in many countries, okay, I'm not sure about Kenya, but especially in India, I have had such, I've read about such instances. So if you can highlight uh, how it affects the concept of balance of power, especially in the context of decision making. And uh, second, uh, secondly, uh, when I'm talking about conflict uh, resolution, uh, I just want to give an example, for example, Russia and Ukraine. So there's currently a huge tussle going on and US has been trying to interfere. So when we talk about such situations, such delicate situations where uh, NGOs generally uh, don't intervene, especially in the concept of mediation or diplomacy part. So what what if uh, what would be the role of NGOs if they enter this field and how it can, um, you know, uh, impact in a positive manner when it comes to such type of uh, conflict resolutions? So if at all you can uh, throw some light on these two aspects. Thank you. Yeah, these are tough questions, but uh, excellent questions. 
So I think um, on one level, I, I think it's absolutely true that um, international funding can influence decision making and can influence what's been done. And I think this is one of the biggest critiques of Western aid in general, um, is that you have a lot of um, donors are calling the shots and donors are deciding what's being done rather than people on the ground. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons you've seen, uh, we've seen globally a big call for increased accountability, including accountability of donors. Um, I'm not sure that we're making as much progress on that as we would like. Um, well, I don't think we're making as much progress on that as we would like. Um, but one of the things that you do see with um, many Western NGOs, or at least US-based NGOs, is that they are not funded by the US government. They're funded by individuals or foundations in the US. So it becomes um, less of a foreign governments are making decisions for other countries and more of a potentially foreign individuals are making some decisions. Um, and this is where I think, um, I didn't spend too much time on this slide because I wanted to make sure we had time for, for questions, but you know, I think some of the, this is some of the real downside of reliance on NGOs for service provision or um, you know, not strengthening the state is that you can have a situation where foreign actors, sometimes including just wealthy foreign individuals are deciding what's happening in countries, occasionally countries that they've never been to. Um, and I think that that's, that's very disturbing. Um, I see in the chat that someone says the state might take measures to stop international funding over a period of time. And yeah, that certainly happened in many places. Um, so uh, Nirmala, I agree with, with um, all of these questions that, yeah, once the tap runs dry, that's a massive problem. We're, we're assuming that it's gonna continue um, sort of indefinitely, but we don't know that to be the case. Whereas we know that governments are going to stay in their countries. We don't know about international NGOs and international funding, um, particularly in these times of, of uncertainty with pandemics and climate change and all these things happening. Um, but then a lot of governments are stepping in and saying, um, I think Russia actually does this, Ethiopia comes to mind. So they say like no organization can get more than 10% of its funding from any one international source. And so in an effort to, to reduce that, uh, it looks like India, uh, did this bill pass the FCRA? Uh, it's it's not a new bill. Uh, it's an old sort of regulation which regulates, uh, you know, foreign funds coming into NGOs. And mm -hmm. what they made is they sort of changed certain provisions in it, uh, which have made uh, it actually very difficult to work with foreign funds. So you can't subgrant any of the money that you get. And so in different ways, they've, uh, you know, it's not directly strangulated, but in, indirectly, they've sort of created lots of hurdles. Yeah. So I think there's pros and cons to that. So um, going into doing this research, I probably would have said, you know, on some level, that's a good thing so that you don't have too much influence from, from, the, from the outside. But I think on another level, you know, if what most of these NGOs are doing, most of the people who are working in the NGOs are working in the NGOs because they want a job. And most of them are Kenyan um, or, or local. So you don't actually have a lot of foreigners um, you know, they are making decisions. And so, you know, I think a lot of it depends on how, it depends on the individual organization and how strict they are or how tightly they're controlling what you do. But it's hard to look at something like an NGO that's providing deworming drugs or that's providing vaccinations or that's providing, you know, most medical or health things. It's hard to, to see that as very, um, I think it's political in how it's distributed and it can be certainly manipulated um, in terms of which parts of countries or which types of people get access to it, but it usually does go towards people who need it. Um, and so I think that that can be- um, if, I, if, I may, <laughs> if I can sort of ask a question myself, uh, I mean, I know your, your interest was more in terms of what uh, the, the this, these relationships are doing to the state itself. Uh, but if you flip the, 
mirror and say what are, what is it doing to civil society itself uh, i don't know if you had an opportunity to explore that or look at that question yeah i think that um and this does get to these questions of decision making i think potentially a downside of it is that it can weaken civil society and it can um there there is a a real danger of civil society being co-opted into government and and civil society sort of doing more of what sort of just doing what government says to be done um if you think about civil society such as it is in china you see a lot of that i think that's you know the extreme example where all ngos are actually somehow linked to the government um they're often called gongos so governmental ngos um but i think that you did see this in kenya around 2005 the the kibaki administration had brought in so many civil society leaders that civil society started being worried that it was going to collapse because so many people from civil society who had been in the opposition for a very long time and in some cases had taken refuge in civil society were brought into the government um, and allied with the Kibaki regime. And so there was a, a, particularly among people who, who refused to get involved in that, there was a bit of an outcry, mostly among governance NGOs and, and advocacy, advocacy NGOs that government was, was eating civil society and that this was going to have a really negative effect um, over time. What ended up happening um, is that there was sort of a, a reduction of civil society for a couple of years. At, at the same time, actually, you had donor funds moving away from civil society and towards the government because many donors were were not pleased with the Moy regime. Uh, Moy did a lot of things to maintain in power, stay in power for longer than ideal. He was in power for uh, nearly 25 years. Um, and um and so civil society became quite weak when donors switched a lot of not only did a lot of leaders from civil society move into the government but funds also went into the government um and so you can have from a lot of different directions you can have a weakening of of civil society um and so i think that's something that to be paid attention to as well um ultimately i think there's a theoretical or, or normative question about what we want civil society to do and what role it should play in a country. So in places like the US, you have relatively weak government in terms of public administration and the size of government, like employees per capita. Um, we have a very long, long tradition of non-state actors doing things that, that governments would do in other countries. Um, but whether or not that's the best way for things to happen, I think, um, is not completely clear. Sorry, I have one more question. I just want to slip that in as well. Uh, so at least in the Indian context, I mean, what I've observed over the last, you know, at least 15 odd years is, uh, I mean, in an era when there was a lot of quote unquote collaboration going on between NGOs and the Indian government. Um, if you spoke to some of the bureaucrats, there was a lot of resentment because they would see the, you know, the perks and privileges that the NGOs would get, especially those who have sort of, you know, were funded internationally. Over the years, as sort of, you know, things have become better for the government, those working in government itself, and in, in a sense, they've got to re been able to reassert their power. They've they've actively gone, you know, in the opposite direction. Uh, sort of, and and you can you can sort of see this resentment being acted out at some in some places in some in cases as well. So uh, so even though in um, maybe in a short or immediate term, you know uh, we see many of the things that you described. I mean, is it is it? I mean, do you see a potential that in the longer term, uh, you know, this resentment could also build up, and we might be seeing a different you know outcome here. Uh, yeah, I think that's absolutely. Um, absolutely poss possible. Um, you, we've seen something similar in Kenya where, um, and actually one of my former doctoral students wrote a paper about this in Haiti, looking at how much more NGOs were being, NGO workers were being paid than civil servants. Um, and I think that there's, 
I'm trying to think of how it's uh, evolved over time, but I think that certainly uh, there's a there's an issue where um, sorry, I'm sort of thinking three things at the same time and trying to decide which way to go with it. Um, I think on one hand, governments in Kenya or governments in a lot of places have increased salaries and increased benefits to employees because they were losing so many. And in the 1980s and 90s with the liberalization of civil of the civil service and the liberalization of sort of the, the, the ethos of liberalization, which was really pushed by Western donor, um, Western donors more than anything, you had sort of the hollowing out of the state and you had really low salaries, low benefits, low morale, um, and that 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 probably did need to, to equalize a bit. Um, so I know I've talked to university professors in Kenya who at one point, they hadn't had salary increases in, in maybe decades and they were making extremely low money and they they did an adjustment. What ended up happening is that all the professors were just doing all of their work was outsourcing and contracting work. And so they, they happened to be involved, uh, to be um, professors, but really none of their money came from the being doing work outside of the university. And so the government of Kenya saw that and it saw that what, what it was doing to the university is that the teaching quality was going down and all sorts of problems were happening. And so they, they raised, you know, they raised the professor's salary to a, a, a very competitive, strong salary in the Kenyan context. Um, and so I think on one level that can be problematic if, but it can go too far as well. So it sounds like what's happened perhaps with civil servants in India is what's happened with MPs and politicians in Kenya. So MPs in Kenya are some of the highest paid Kenyans and, and best, um, have the most benefits of anyone in the entire world. I think it's among the top three highest paid um, members of parliament. Um, and so there's a lot of outcry against that. And I think that the same thing could happen that you need to get to a place where it's more balanced. Um, but ultimately, especially in places where you have foreign funding, I think it is better to fund governments than to fund, um, than to have foreign funded civil society making decisions because of these questions about sovereignty um, and so on. I see, I realized I didn't answer the question um, about international peacekeeping and I see that there's also one about um, more local conflict prone countries. Um, and I think that if you look at what NGOs actually do, I am not not sure that they are particularly successful in this area, but areas where I see them making the most effort is in things like sensitization or um, training uh, for regular people in terms of what peace can look like. It's the same thing with democracy promotion. So you have a lot of NGOs in different places in, in weak democracies, this is maybe less true in India, um, but in a lot of weak democracies, you have NGOs talking about, you know, how does the electoral process work? How do you, um, basically what, what do elections mean and what do they do? And I think you can have the same sort of training um, in conflict situations. Certainly there's a lot of cross cultural or cross ethnicity, cross religion, um, efforts that NGOs are well known for. Um, but I think at the, at the higher level, it's very difficult for NGOs to have enough power to be seen as a legitimate intermediary. Um, and I think that's why you see UN agencies, sort of big international agencies step in more um, with um, negotiators or, or African Union or whatever it is, depending on which area of the world. Um, so I'm not sure, I would say that, that NGOs are best suited or they make the most strides um, when they're um, at more local levels. And so, you know, training at the conflict prevention level might be more useful. So looking at what NGOs have done in Kenya, 
where there hasn't been a great deal of conflict, but there was um, a lot of post-election violence after the 2008, oh, sorry, 2007 elections, which were held in December of 2007. And in, there was a considerable conflict, about 500,000 people displaced um, in Kenya. It's the, the highest level of conflict that Kenya's ever seen. And you had a lot of NGOs in the election since then do um, a lot of trainings and um, and um, a lot of efforts towards maintaining peace and peaceful elections and, and non-conflict uh, solutions, non-violent conflict solutions to problems. Um, and I'm not sure if it's those efforts that have been successful or if, um, I think a lot of Kenyans were shocked by how bad things became in 2008. And so you, you hear a lot of Kenyans talk about like, well, we can never have that happen again. And so it's not it's not clear that it's the NGO specifically that that made the changes or whether um, it was sort of a societal recognition that that there was too much to lose um, to have that kind of conflict. Um, I don't think I don't see any more other questions on chat and uh, if there aren't any other questions in the audience, I think um, we've, so I think I'll take then the opportunity to formally thank you uh, for this wonderful session. I think it's sort of, you know, given us plenty to think about. And I think that what people already, you can see that happening and you, that was happening with me also, I was sort of reflecting on, you know, the Indian experience in some sense, the one that we are more familiar with and saying, okay, mm -hmm. well, what does it really imply here? So, so thank you again for taking the time to join us. And yeah, uh, thank you. And hopefully we could, uh, you know, when things are quote unquote more normal, we'd love to have you visit us at some point and, uh, you know, have a sort of give this lecture in house. So that'd be great. That would be wonderful.